afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Glenn Weil, and uh, you can call me Professor Weil, you can call me Glenn, you can call me by any nickname you come up with for me. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be giving three guest lectures in this course. This is the first one. I'll give two others, one covering decision theory and one covering the choice uh, by monopolist of uh, non-price characteristics of their products, like product quality. Um, Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about sort of the basics of monopoly theory. Much, if not most, of this course is going to focus on the behavior of consumers and firms when they think prices are given. But I think it's useful to start out uh, the course with um, a consideration of what happens when these assumptions are violated. Um, and this is exactly what a uh, model of the market power incorporate, and I think these can be useful for three main reasons. First of all, they give us a more detailed and rich understanding of pricing behavior uh, once we take into account the fact that firms choose their prices, their uh, production, not just to maximize profit given prices, but also to affect uh, the prices that they face. Second, when we think about um, bigger areas of policy on which economics has had an important influence, such as antitrust, regulation, intellectual property, and so forth. The issues are sort of inherently about uh, how firms uh, price in a monopolistic fashion. And so in order to really study those issues, we need to consider models for kind of an influence over price. And finally, when you want to think about what the optimal policy is for the government to follow, the government is sort of the ultimate monopolist, right? And so almost everything it does impacts prices and markets. So you can often analyze many government policy issues, such as redistribution of wealth, uh, unemployment insurance, many other uh, issues, as applications of a monopolist optimal uh, pricing uh, schedule. So sort of the foundational model in uh, analyzing uh, situations of market power is a model with just one firm, usually called the monopoly model. And um, this is what I'm going to try to develop today. So first I'll talk about the way in which control over a market influence over price gives an incentive for a monopolist to reduce his quantity below what would be uh, socially optimal, below the point where price equals marginal cost. I'll then um, quantify that using Lerner's classic elasticity pricing rule and talk about the inefficiency caused by that distortion, the dead weight loss of monopoly, um, and how to measure it. I'll then talk about the comparative statics of monopoly. So in competitive markets, we often start thinking about comparative statics by asking what would be, say, the incidence of attacks or something like that, and the basic logic behind that lets us analyze a number of different interventions in competitive markets. Similarly, when we think about monopoly, it's useful to think about the rate at which a tax is passed through to consumers, sort of uh, an analog in the monopoly case of the incidence of a tax. And um, that will allow us not just to analyze uh, that you know, one concept itself, but just as in the perfectly competitive case, we can also uh, connect it up with the way in which surplus is divided between the monopoly uh, and consumers, as well as the effects uh, that other types of interventions will have on the monopolist optimal strategy, such as a shift in uh, the demand curve or a um, change in the price of one of our competitors. And finally, if I get a chance, I'll talk a little bit about empirical evidence on measuring monopoly demand curve uh, and thereby pass through rate. So, sort of the fundamental idea of monopoly theory, which it was quantified at least as far back as Cordova's work in the 1830s, but um, is, is probably much, much older than that, is that monopolies have an incentive to reduce quantities below what would occur in a competitive market in order to try to raise the price of those commodities. And the basic reason why they raise prices is because this is the only way they can charge more for the inframarginal units that they're selling. So those are the units that 
you know, are going to be bought regardless of whether the price is what they're currently charging or something higher. But the only way that you can charge a higher price for those units is to raise the price even on the marginal units in the market. Um, and this creates a basic trade-off for the monopolist between selling more goods and selling the goods that they do sell at a higher price. Um, and in particular, you can make, this can be quantified by thinking about the um, uh, monopolist profit function, which is uh, the price that it charges for its products, P, time, P of Q times Q, uh, times Q, the amount that it sells, minus the cost. And if it's going to maximize those profits, it's not going to set price equal to marginal cost in the competitive market. Instead, it's going to set the marginal revenue, the marginal value of P, P times Q, equal to marginal cost. Um, is Chow Chow here? Chow Chow? Yeah, I Yeah. Yes. But do you, oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, could you tell me what the formula for marginal revenue is? Well, marginal revenue uh, is total revenue for the derivative of total revenue with respect to the quantity. But in terms of uh, like the price, the demand function and quantity? Um, so we know that in a competitive market, a firm sets price equal to marginal cost. 
we know that a monopolistic firm will set marginal revenue to the marginal cost. He has, so whatever the difference is between this and price must be a distortion created by monopoly. And in fact, it's very clear why that's exactly the distortion created by monopoly, because it's all driven by the fact that you change the price. If you didn't change the price at all, if you took price as given, you would always assume P prime is zero, right? And so that exactly shows how this simplifies yeah. the competitive case. So before um, we go on to develop the elasticity interpretation, I just wanted to highlight um, some particular forms <coughs> of the um, marginal revenue curve. So the, um, on the upper uh, left here, I've drawn a constant elasticity um, demand curve. Uh, on the upper right, I've drawn a linear demand curve. Uh, on the bottom left, I've drawn an exponential demand curve. And I've drawn a quadratic demand curve on the bottom right, which is concave. And then the demand curves are in uh, blue, but their marginal revenue curves are in red. And you see that the, rest, the relationship between the marginal revenue and demand curves is very different across these different types of demand functions. So in their constant elasticity, you see that as the quantity increases, the distance between the marginal revenue uh, and the demand curve shrinks. Right? Under the linear demand curve, they start at the same point, and then the distance between them grows at a constant linear rate. Under the exponential demand curve, they maintain constant vertical distance between one another. And under the quadratic demand curve, they again start at one point, but they diverge increasingly rapidly. And the key difference between these different demand curves is their curvature. So the curvature of the demand curve is going to be a key variable which determines uh, how the relationship between the marginal revenue and demand curve works. And we're going to focus on that quite a bit uh, a bit later in the lecture. But in the meantime, I just want to um, remind you of the way that graphically you can use the marginal revenue curve to determine the monopoly's optimal price and quantity. So what you do is you do the marginal, he's going to always maximize where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Right? And um, I haven't drawn marginal cost curves here, but imagine that they correspond to the horizontal axis in these drawings. Then what you can do is you can just find the intersection points, uh, like here. You can then draw, you know that that's going to be the optimal quantity. You can then draw a line up to the demand curve and over to the price that corresponds to that. And that gives you the optimal price under all these uh, various demand curves. <coughs> so, um, another way that we can write the marginal revenue curve is the price times 1 minus the inverse elasticity of demand. And is uh, Allison Rao here? Yep, hey. Could you tell me how, to, how, we, how we get that? How do we derive that formula? Um, by if you want, you can come up here and write on the slide. <laughs> Well, so we know that the expression for the monopoly, <coughs> right, is uh, for the uh, marginal revenue is P plus P prime times Q. So can anyone... Can we add in a... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Add in a Q. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. So if we do... We have the inverse. Over P we get 1 plus... 
prime is going to give us well, that's the inverse of the, the uh, this this expression here. Yeah, this is exactly the inverse of the elasticity, right? Because p prime, if we flip that over by the implicit function theorem, we can cross this out and we can get a q prime down here, and then we have q prime times p over q on the bottom, and that's exactly the elastic <coughs> negative of the elasticity of demand, right? So that, that's what gives us this formula. Yeah, okay. So um, one thing this immediately tells us is that if the marginal, marginal revenue will always be negative whenever the elasticity of demand is less than one. So if the elasticity of demand is less than one, revenues will be declining as we increase quantity. And therefore, a monopolist with, you know, uh, positive marginal cost will never produce a <coughs> of elasticity if demand is less than one. Um, and they'll always have an incentive to reduce the quantity at that point because they can save on their cost and they can uh, reduce the and they can increase the price that they charge. So, yeah, but maybe I need to take the. One becomes a monopolist and the elasticity is less than one type. And then you start pricing as a monopolist. Well be, be, because you, you want to think that you become a monopolist when the when the elasticity is well, well when the demand is inelastic. And and then and then you will start pricing as a as a Well I I think as this analysis is gonna indicate um, the degree to which you have an optimal incentive to increase your price is related to your elasticity. But you could well be a monopolist with a very high elasticity of demand, right? So I'm not sure that it's true. If your elasticity is extremely, extremely, extremely high, then we can basically ignore any incentive that you have to distort your price. But on the other hand, you know, an elasticity of four or five will still lead to a substantial markup, as we'll see in a moment. So you can have significant market power even when a firm has an elasticity well above one. So this is sort of the most extreme case, but I would guess that there are probably aren't that many cases when a monopoly initially uh, faces a, uh, an elasticity of demand which is uh, less than one. But, but there probably are some. So, so do you mind giving some, some intuition of why the, the monopolist is standing in the elastic part of the demand? Yeah, sure. So if the monopolist is uh, producing in a part of the demand where it's inelastic, then he can actually raise his total income by uh, just reducing the quantity, right? So the marginal revenue is negative, right? And so that's never going to be optimal as long as it costs him anything to produce the uh, product, right? Um, so. I mean, one example of this, by the way, is, um, so the, there's been, a, in recent years, a lot of uh, drug wars in Central America, and the United States has tried to reduce the supply of goods coming in. But actually, in the process, they've increased the amount of violence that goes on to the profits in the industry. Why? Because the demand for most drugs is pretty inelastic. And so by reducing the quantity, you actually raise the price increase the total amount of profits that the gangs are making, and therefore increase violence to try to retain those profits. So you're, you're essentially doing exactly what someone who had a monopoly over drug production would do. You're reducing the quantity when the demand is in the last <coughs> um, So the elasticity of demand is sort of the key way that economists summarize the incentive that firms have to raise their price uh, under monopoly. So it's sort of an overall summary of how big a firm is in the market and how small are the opportunities of consumers to substitute to alternative goods. Um, if we just rearrange setting that formula equal to marginal cost, we obtain <coughs> the classic learner elasticity pricing rule, which states that the difference between price and cost, the markup, divided by price, that's often called the relative markup, is equal to the inverse elasticity of demand. 
So the more elastic is the demand, the smaller is the markup. So to return to the question, if the mark, even if the elasticity were four, you would still have a relative markup of 25%. So 25% of the price of the good would represent uh, the monopoly markup. So this is commonly used as a measure of market power, a measure of how much monopoly there is in some sense. But one thing to note is that can be a bit problematic um, in certain cases. So if you think about the credit card industry, I don't know how many of you guys have credit cards, probably most of you, but you actually basically get paid to use your credit card, right? They give you points rather than you having to pay anything. And so they're basically charging you a negative price. Now, does that mean that you have a negative elasticity of demand? Well, probably not, right? And the reason is that the um, marginal cost they face is not actually positive because they're able to earn money off merchants <coughs> every time you use your card. So they're actually being subsidized. And so once something's being subsidized, this learner rule really doesn't make very much sense at all. So um, often in cases like that, it makes more sense to use um, the absolute markup that the firm charges, which is just that P prime times Q uh, formula that we talked about earlier. Yeah, go ahead. From the other side, I mean, you're charging the merchants the, the privilege to be able to let customers pay for the car. They, yeah. They, 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 do, they do have a cost of giving that because they have to pay us to use the car. Yes. And then they charge the merchant a markup over the cost they give us. Right? Yeah. They get 1% rewards and the merchant has to pay 2% or yeah. whatever it is. Well, so you could think about the market power in that aggregated way, or you could think about it in each market independently. So they certainly probably have some market power over the merchants. But I think it would be a bit strange to think that you don't have market power over consumers because there are only you know, four major credit card companies, basically, and most people are pretty stuck with them. So I think that if they weren't being subsidized by the merchants, you would be seeing significant markups. And we shouldn't sort of ignore that market power they have over consumers just because they're getting this subsidy, right? So if you choose to view the market power in this disaggregated way, it's important not to just think about the inverse elasticity because that doesn't really make much sense. Instead, you can the absolute markup they charge over the profits that they're earning per transaction you do from the merchants. In fact, we're going to study exactly the model that you were suggesting uh, in one of the future lectures. So we'll talk more about that issue. Yeah, go ahead. But net, net, uh, is it fair to say that you know, the consumer is getting subsidized even all the you know, financing you know, costs are being charged to consumers or not you know, paying their credit card balances every month? Yeah, so I mean, it, that, it's, a bit, it's a bit complicated. I think the evidence suggests that on net they are being subsidized significantly, <coughs> but that there are some consumers who get in a lot of trouble. Um, but I, I would guess, and I'm not sure, that most of you are in the camp that you're being heavily subsidized. I certainly am. If you are sort of smart and pay off your credit card bills, you end up getting subsidized in equilibrium, and it's sort of like poor, uninformed people who end up uh, helping to further subsidize you along with the merchants. So, um, so the <coughs> monopoly basically has two effects from a normative perspective. First of all, it transfers wealth from consumers to the monopolist, right? Because um, it raises prices, and that means consumers pay more than monopolists receive. But this doesn't have, at least at the first uh, Pass any net social loss associated with that, right? It's just a transfer. But there's a second effect of monopoly, which is that it reduces the quantity of the goods consumed. Because in order to raise the price, the monopolist has to reduce the number of sales that occur. And, um, and basically, what that means that there's some people who would be willing to pay a price below the monopoly price but above the monopoly's costs, who are denied access to the market. Um, and this is what's called the deadweight loss from monopoly. Um, and the key reason, again, is that the monopolist, in order to charge more for his inframarginal units, has to charge uh, more also for the marginal units. And this is not something the monopolist is you know, delighted about, that he's causing all this deadweight loss. In fact, this is exactly what you'd like to avoid. So, uh, you know, for example, most drug companies really would like to sell their drugs much more cheaply in poor countries than they do in rich countries because they don't gain anything from losing all the sales that they can make 
at a price that people in that less well-off market can afford. If they are forced to, if they can't stop someone from re-importing things from the poor countries, okay, they're going to charge you know a million bucks for ACT, the you know the most effective AIDS treatment, and exclude all these people in poor countries. But if they can get, if there's some way for them to discriminate and be able to charge those marginal consumers a lower price than these marginal consumers, they're going to be really happy about that. And in fact, you can interpret many of the things that a monopolist does um, from the way it price, the prices, or as we'll talk about in the other lecture, what type, how he designs his products as an attempt to uh, charge lower prices effectively to marginal and intermarginal consumers. So for example, as we'll talk about later, he's going to try to design his products to bring a lot of benefits to marginal consumers and not so many benefits to the informational consumers. So, um, consumer, um, basically the consequences of having this price above marginal cost are that anyone who buys from the monopolist generates an externality. What's that externality? Well, he creates some profits for the monopolist, right? The difference between price and marginal cost is the marginal profit the monopolist earns as a result of someone purchasing product, right? And that uh, means that, uh, and the only way to internalize that externality, of course, is to put a subsidy which is equal to the market, right? Which would bring you back to the competitive level. Um, so, this creates sort of a natural question, which is, if market power is really just an externality, why don't we just internalize it in the same way we do any other externality? Why don't we just give a subsidy to firms that are monopolies? Or why don't we mandate uh, <coughs> higher quantities, like you would in something like cap and trade? Right? Um, in practice, uh, we really don't use these solutions very often. It's very uncommon that a response to market power is to subsidize the, the good. Um, Jorge Garcia, do you, uh, well, why do you think we might not use uh, the Gubian remedies to solve market power problems? I mean, which one do you, you want to mandate? I, I, yeah, I really don't know. That's, a, that's one good point, right? So the monopolist may know a lot more about his cost function than you do. And he may have an incentive to distort the quantity that is optimal downward in order to try to raise his markup if you mandate quantity. And if you, um, if you try to subsidize the monopolist, right, to bring down his markup to cost, he's going to want that subsidy to be, be as big as possible, and so he's going to claim his markup is huge, right? So it may be very difficult to design a system that gives the monopolist an incentive to truthfully reveal the quantity. So those, those are two major issues. Another major problem is that, so we were treating the transfers to the monopolist as if they were just, you know, socially neutral. We didn't care whether the monopolist got the money or not, right? Because it was just a transfer. But the problem with that perspective is that usually monopolies don't just come out of thin air, they come out of some action that people take. So you could invent a new product that's really beneficial to society, and that could help create a monopoly, right? Or you could lobby the government, which waste a bunch of money lobbying the government to exclude people from competing with you, right? And that's a total waste of society, that expenditure. And so the money that the monopolist makes is not just really a transfer, it's really an input to another stage of thinking where the monopolist is, de whether someone's determining where, whether to try to obtain a monopoly or not. And so the subsidies that you give or do not give have an important impact on whether people end up doing things like lobbying the government, innovating, and, and the subsidies you're going to want to target the sub monopoly does something beneficial to be in that position and not to places where it does something harmful. And an indiscriminate subsidy for market power may not do a very good job at distinguishing the type of situation. So, like any other externality or tax, we can calculate the distortion created by monopoly using the standard 
Harberger triangle argument, which is that the marginal distortion created by a uh, decrease in quantity is equal to the wedge between willingness to pay and willingness to accept, the markup, times the quantity, right? We do that for taxes. If, if this was the tax formula, the um, effect on social welfare would be T times DQ. If it was an externality, it would be the size of the marginal externality times DQ. And here, the externality is exactly the markup of the monopolist tax, right? Um, and so we can just measure this with a standard dead weight loss triangle. Really, the only difference in the case of monopoly, which we'll explore in a little bit, is that <coughs> the actual size of this is determined by the monopoly's optimization. And this gives it a particular uh, shape and relationship to the monopoly's profit. Now, one very important thing to note is that this formula, like all the standard formulas for welfare with externalities or taxes, assumes that every other commodity is supplied perfectly competitively with no externalities and so forth. Right? Now, that may seem, well, look, that's reasonable in other circumstances, it must be reasonable here, but the important thing to note is that um, that means that all the substitutes for the monopoly's products, the things that people buy instead of the monopoly's product when it reduces its quantity, must have no markup on them at all. That is, any competitor of the monopolist must be a perfect competitor. And um, that's actually a pretty problematic <coughs> assumption because this is, you know, in many industries, uh, a firm might have market power, but it might just not have an overwhelmingly larger amount of market power than any other firm which consumers substitute. And if consumers substitute to another good, which has a positive market, that creates an externality for the producer of that other good, right? So the real formula for monopoly dead weight loss is not what I put up the top, but it's really this thing here. The markup of the monopolist minus the average markup of products to which the consumers substitute rather than by the monopolist product times DQ. So what that tells us is that it's not really monopoly power itself that creates the distortion. It's the fact that monopoly power is unevenly distributed across different firms. If all firms had the same amount of monopoly power, it would be perfectly competitive. It would be just as efficient as if things were perfectly competitive. So another thing that that says, for example, just to bring this home, is that if there's a bunch of uh, monopolistic firms, and then a perfectly competitive firm enters to compete with them, that's really bad. Right? So, in fact, it's just as bad if a perfectly competitive firm enters to compete against a bunch of monopolists as it is if a monopolist enters to compete against a bunch of perfectly competitive firms. So, it is the dispersion of monopoly power, not its existence, that creates social laws. Yeah? This other markup, is it weighted like the distribution? It's weighted by the fraction. It's it's the, <coughs> quant yeah, the quantity of substitution weighted average markup of the other firms to which the consumer substitute. So just, just, just to emphasize this one more time, um, imagine you take a model like they do in international trade with market power in general equilibrium, and you can consider two different versions of the model. In one case, there's like a bunch of companies that are monopolistic, and then there's some outside numerator good, which is perfectly competitively supplied. In that model, there's going to be tons of distortions. There's going to be too little produced by all the monopolists to form. It's going to look like a standard monopoly model. On the other hand, if you remove the numerator good and just have the monopolistically competitive firms in the economy, then uh, basically it's going to be an absolute first best economy. Everything will be a first best option. So it just makes a huge difference what consumers substitute to when they don't purchase your credit. So ignore it, yeah. Can okay, they only substitute towards not buying something? Okay, can we take you compare it to the, to the 
the like, dreamland case where there's just no one out there at all? Wouldn't that always be better? I mean, no, I just don't understand. No, why. I mean, I don't think consumers can substitute to not buying anything at all because consumers have to satisfy their budget constraint at the end, right? Yeah, but that constraint holds with the quality if you assume that all uses are going to be included in this whole <coughs> Yeah, but I don't think anyone's going to be very interested in doing those things. I mean, most people hold on to money in order to buy something with it, right? So, I mean, if you're saying in the future things will be perfectly competitively supplied, then that's an intertemporal competition with something which is perfectly competitively supplied. So, there's a, people are always going to be substituting to something else, right? The question is how competitively supplied is that something else? Um, so, sticking with... Yeah, go ahead. But, uh, but I mean, so, rather than burning money, yeah, but see, that actually is, is a great example of exa exactly the type of problem. So in most economies, there's a tax on labor, right? And so there's going to be some distortive effect of them substituting to leisure as well, right? So, yeah, so, I mean, in other words, that's another thing which is imperfectly competitively supplied effectively because the government is <coughs> acting as a monopolist and taking away some of your labor income, right? So essentially anything that the consumer substitutes to at least potentially has some market power. Yes, I... Um, is this... I'm, I'm not sure I understand this. Is this saying that there's several monopolies just that the, the marginal daily loss from one of their market power is zero if they're all the same? Or is it further saying that if all of them together lost their market power, that they wouldn't have any? If there's there. no substitution to the outside good, then then and there's only substitution between the monopolists, there is absolutely no dead weight loss from the from them having market power relative to the perfect competitive. There is substitution to the outside good. Well, yes, for sure. But the monopoly model is going to dramatically overstate how much dead weight loss there is because it's going to account the full Harvard or Triangle, whereas you should only be counting a very small part of that, which comes from the substitution to the outside go. So uh, if we stick with the standard version, where it is just the Harvard or Triangle, uh, we can draw these things out graphically very nicely. Let me just show you them. So this is a standard uh, picture. Um, here you've got the marginal cost curve, which I've drawn as U shape, and here's the linear demand curve and its corresponding marginal revenue curve, right? So, um, this area E here, that's the dead weight loss, right? Um, and the dead weight loss is basically composed of two parts. A reduction in consumer surplus up here, and a reduction in the returns, the fundamental returns on the monopoly's capital. Here. And uh, we can then calculate sort of all the quantities that we're interested in based on this graph. So where's the monopoly's profit? Well, it's the area between price, which is right here. We, we get that from intersecting marginal revenue with marginal cost, drawing the line up to the uh, demand curve and over to the price. And then we can take the area between price and marginal cost for the monopoly's profits. But notice we should also be able to take the area between marginal revenue and marginal cost, right? So if you integrate the difference between marginal revenue and marginal cost, that's exactly marginal profits. And therefore, that should be the same. What's that area? Well, here's marginal revenue, the red line. And then the marginal cost is the yellow curve. So this area A plus C should be the same as the area D plus C, which it is because these triangles here are similar, right? Um, to get consumer surplus, we can either measure it as the area underneath demand and above the price, as we usually do, uh, or we can measure it as, so if the monopoly could capture all the value in the market, <coughs> she would get the area between the demand curve and the marginal cost curve, right? So whatever is not captured by her must be exactly the consumer surplus. So that's the area of B plus D, right? And again, that's the same as A plus B, because D and A are the same. Okay. Um, so, when we say the word monopoly, it sounds a lot like 
This is the only company out there, right? I mean, that's sort of like almost the definition of what monopoly means, right? But the basic mechanisms that we uh, are considering uh, apply to any firm that doesn't take prices as given. Right? And the size of the distortion obviously depends on the elasticity of demand. So we can make, you know, we can make it small by you know, having the elasticity be high or close to competition, or large by having it low, but it doesn't really require that this is the only firm out there. So a natural question is when we should imply, apply a monopoly model to think about a situation of market power, or when we should apply a monopoly <coughs> model, which we'll study later in the course. Is Munso here? Lins, yeah. Yeah. What, um, what do you think are some reasons why it might be useful? Or what do you think might be some of the limitations of using a monopoly model rather than a monopoly model? So, I mean, we can always think of a firm as being a monopolist, given some, you know, residual demand curve that it has, taking fixed, you know, what other firms are doing. But in what cases do you think that analysis would miss out on important effects? Well, at that, we can also, we can actually capture pretty well using the monopoly model, because you can just say, look, if I think the other firms are going to reduce their price, <laughs> When I reduce my price, then um, then you can just incorporate that as my demand curve becoming uh, more elastic or less elastic. So, so I, I actually don't think that that poses a basic problem for using a bit off the bottom. They have a lot of the problem. And does anyone else have any ideas of, of what are the problems? Yeah. Can you use a monopoly when you have some kind of strategic interaction? So, so again, I mean, I think that a lot of those types of things, I mean, the question is, for what types of analyses or problems does that change things so we can't represent it by just some residual demand curve? Yeah, yeah so that, that, I think that's, that's a very good point. So when we're think, we want to think about issues, of what is the effect of a new firm entering into the industry, obviously a model that only has one firm is not going to be very useful for thinking about that type of a question, right? So if we're thinking about just the behavior of one firm, it's, the monopoly model works pretty well, except that you have to notice that what do we use models for? We use them to figure out what are the effects of various interventions we can make on an industry, right? Like if we put on a tax, if we put on a regulation, what will happen, right? And the problem is the monopoly model only looks at the direct effects of those, you know, of those interventions. It doesn't think about how the residual demand curve is going to shift as a result of those interactions, interventions. And that's exactly what the oligopoly model and strategic interactions might help us to think about. Right? Um, another thing is that the monopoly model, as I was pointing out, ignores the effect that I have on the profits being earned by other firms, right? And so that's going to lead it to systematically overstate, overstate dead weight loss. Because it doesn't take into account the spillovers that uh, me selling less has on other firms being able to sell more, and therefore uh, earning greater profits. Third, uh, as, what's your name? Gabriana. Gabriana said, um, the monopoly model uh, doesn't allow us to think about changes in the structure of an industry. It doesn't let us very effectively think about the entry of a new firm. It doesn't let us think about the effects of a merger between two companies because there's only one company to think about. So monopoly models, when we're trying to think about issues that inherently involve how the industry structure is changing, are not very useful. Nonetheless, even with all these properties, Often a monopoly is an extremely useful starting point for thinking about a broad range of issues of market power. So, for example, one basic intuition that comes out of a monopoly model is that whenever a firm faces, uh, whenever a firm's good gets more elastic, it's going to increase its quantity produced. And so what that says is, unlike in a competitive market, a firm that now faces a new competitor might actually increase quantity. 
rather than decreasing it. Why? Because if their demand becomes more elastic, that could outweigh the reduction in the quantity. Of the demand. Right? Another example of that might be, um, so the traditional analysis suggests that demand functions are more elastic in the long run than in the short run, right? So you, you would naturally think that if there's a good, let's say, like heroin or something like that, which is much more elastic in the long run than in the short run, a monopolist that controls the market will uh, produce a lot more in the long run than they will in the uh, short run. What does that mean? So in the long run, they face a more elastic demand curve that will even produce more. That means if they expect to maintain their monopoly for a long period of time, right, they're actually going to produce more and have a more competitive price than if they only expect to maintain their monopoly for a short period of time. So even when there are issues related to competition that come in, there's a lot of things that just the incentives of a single firm uh, help us uh, analyze. Okay, so um, now I want to start thinking about the comparative statics rather than just the level of monopoly prices, right? So probably like the most common thing that the competitive models are used for is to think about things like what's the incidence of the tax or the shift in demand or something like that. How does that cause things to change? So a natural thing to do to start thinking about monopoly comparative statics is to think about what's the effect of the tax on a monopolist. Um, and just to review, let's think about how we do this in the case of competition. So in competition, price is equal to marginal cost. The tax raises the marginal cost by a unit. So we can derive the effect that a tax has on, um, competition, on price by using the implicit function theorem. And we get And we get this expression here, 
anyone want to just uh, try to articulate why, why it would be related to the <coughs> how the price changes when demand changes? Okay, no volunteers, so I'll just go through it. Um, okay, so imagine that there's a subsidy given to consumers, right? That's a natural way to increase their demand, right? You just give them an extra dollar for purchasing the product, they're going to want more of it, right? And we know that if there's a dollar of subsidy given to consumers for purchasing the good, and a dollar tax placed on producers for producing the good, the net effect of that can't be anything, right? Because it's just like moving money around. This is the classic result about the incidence of taxation being uh, neutral to who exactly collects the tax, right? So, um, what that means is that when the product is subsidized by one dollar to the consumers and taxed by one dollar to the producers, all that's going to happen is that the price is going to rise by exactly one dollar, but the quantity will stay the same, right? And um, what that means is that the amount that the price rises in response to the demand increase, plus the amount that the price rises in response to the cost increase, must be equal to one. So that's what's expressed in this result here. And note that we, we showed that the path through always has to be positive, because otherwise it's the infinite, essentially. And so what that means is that the pass through of the increase in demand may actually be negative. If the demand for the product increases, the monopoly may actually reduce their price. <laughs> so um, that might seem a bit counterintuitive, but it's really related to the point that we made earlier that even if a firm faces a competing product which reduces the amount that they would normally sell, reduces their demand function, that might actually lead them to increase their quantity. Right? So the reason is monopolies decision are all determined by uh, their demand function and what its shape looks like. And the demand function could increase you know, with a constant marginal cost function, that wouldn't cause any change in price, right? But it might change the elasticity of demand, and that might cause the price to either go up or to go down. Um, and so what this tells us is that the pass-through rate also determines how the monopolist responds to demand conditions. If the pass-through rate is high, you should expect that when demand increases, prices fall. If the, when the pass-through is low, you should expect that when prices increase, uh, sorry, when uh, demand increases, prices will rise. And this um, has a very uh, tight connection to what are called strategic complements and strategic substitutes. This is sort of another example of how, even though we're really looking at a monopoly model, it can help us think about what the effects of competition are. Because what does it really do to me when my competitor uh, decreases their price? It basically increases the demand for my product. Sorry, decrease in demand for my product, right? Now, if that decrease in demand for my product leads me to want to lower my price, then I'm going to follow the price that my competitor charges. And that's going to be called strategic compromise. On the other hand, if when my competitor lowers their price and that decreases my demand, that leads me to actually want to raise my price, then I'm going to do the opposite thing of what my rival does. And it's going to uh, be what we call strategic substitute. So to just give you uh, a graphical sense of this a bit, what I've done is draw um, uh, a few diagrams which indicate the effect that demand and cost shapes have on uh, pass-through rates. So in all of these graphs, uh, there's a change in marginal cost by a unit increment, and we're going to figure out how much that affects uh, prices. Here's a concave demand curve, right? When we increase marginal cost by one unit, we move up its marginal revenue curve, but because it's concave, that has a relatively small effect on the price, and the price change is much smaller than the marginal cost change. Here we've got a constant elasticity demand, a small change in the marginal cost moves us way along the marginal revenue curve and way up the demand curve, 
And so we get a price change that's twice as large as the marginal cost change. Um, here we have an increase, we, here now I'm going to fix a linear demand curve. And if we have increasing marginal cost, then the pass-through rate is going to be smaller. And if we have a decreasing marginal cost, the pass-through rate is going to be larger. Now, note that we can also see the other results that we showed on this graph diagram. So the ratio of consumer to producer surplus is much smaller in the cases on the left where the pass-through rate is lower, right, than it is on the cases on the right where the pass-through rate is larger. Because here the profits are smaller, and so the ratio of consumer surplus to profits uh, is larger. But we can also see another result, which I didn't have time to show you guys, which is that the ratio of dead weight loss to profits follows the same pattern. So when the pass-through rate is small, that ratio is relatively small. It's relatively large when, um, uh, when the pass-through rate is large. You see that here uh, as well. OK. Um, one last way to sort of think about why you get these connections is, you know, basically the reason why monopolists would have an incentive to pass through a cost shock a lot is that basically prior to the cost shock, she's basically indifferent over a range of prices. She'd sort of be happy to maybe charge less and go for, you know, a bigger market but a smaller markup, or to charge more and go for a larger markup but a smaller market, right? In that case, a small change to her cost is going to break that indifference. And she's going to chase after, she's going to go uh, after a much higher price, right? On the other hand, if the, the profit function is very concave about the optimum, if she's got a very clearly defined optimal price, then a small change in cost isn't going to change that by very much, right? Because it's all being given by the, uh, by the demand condition. And, of course, what is it that would cause monopolists to be tempted to charge a higher price or a lower price? Well, it's that there's a lot of inframarginal consumer surplus that you could get by charging the higher price, and a lot of dead weight loss that you could get by charging the lower price, right? And so we should very much expect that the dead weight loss and consumer surplus are going to be large whenever the pass through rate is large, which is exactly what we just showed. Okay. So um, a natural question then is how can we actually measure some of these demand curves in the real world? to figure out what they actually look like in practice. And one really easy way to do this, or not easy perhaps, but at least very uh, effective, is to look on the internet. So there's just a ton of data on the internet, right? And a ton of transactions that go on. And a ton of people trying out lots of different things. And this gives us a lot of variation that might allow us to actually figure out what's going on. So a particularly nice example of this is a recent paper by uh, Laurent Ainav et al., uh, which was on the reading list, where they looked at seller experimentation on eBay. So they got every transaction that eBay has had, um, basically ever, uh, and they got all the information about them. And so what they were able to do is identify more than 500 occasions under, on which um, the seller of a good tried different ways of selling the good, at least 15 different ways of selling the good, maybe charging different prices at different times or even at the same time on different listings for an identical product. Um, and then they tried to use this to figure out the effects of changing uh, auction terms or reserve prices in auction or on uh, the demand for the product. Um, basically, what they did is take advantage of the fact that these sellers were themselves trying to learn the demand to allow us to actually learn the demand. Yeah? How did they know that that's what sellers were doing? Well, so, so they didn't know really that sellers were doing that, but what they did do is they tried out about five or six different definitions of what it would mean to be an experiment and made sure that all the results were robust across those. But just because yeah. you, you vary the, the things on the right hand side doesn't mean you get rid of the endogeneity bias, if there is one. Yeah, so uh, one natural, you know, if you think about what could be endogeneity, you can say, well, maybe they're doing these different things. They think they'll catch some people in this market and some people in that market and whatever. But the thing is, there's about five different ways you can define an experiment. So you can only take things that are running at the same time. Or you can only take things that run at different times. Or you can only take things that run at the same time in different countries. Or whatever, right? And the point is that no matter how you cut it, you get the exact same results. 
And that seems to indicate pretty strongly that it is a it is an experiment. Yeah, but the arguments that can be correlated with the error term in all five in different in different ways that lead to a similar result. You saw we got rid of the imaginative bias. But um, that's true of everything, right? You know, I, you could say that a randomized trial doesn't get rid of the indubginating bias because there might be some secret correlation between the pseudo-random generator that you have and whatever. But I think you can find it pretty, uh, pretty compelling that um, if there are, like, different things which would seem, if they have any indubginating problem, to induce completely different types of correlation, all give the same answer, it seems to be pretty strong evidence, I think, uh, that, that, that there's not a major indubginating problem. Uh, so uh, we can so we can use variation in the reserve price, that is the minimum price that you have to pay in order for someone to win the auction, to measure something like a demand curve coming out of eBay auctions. Matt G or Guy? Is Matt Matthew Guy here? No. Does anyone want to try to explain why? Um, what, what it means to have like a demand curve in an auction based on the reserve price? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, so the basic idea is that if you set a high reserve price, right, that means that you're not willing to accept less than a certain amount, that could make the price that you end up getting higher. Why? Well, imagine <coughs> that the top bidder bids above the reserve price, but nobody else does. In that case, if you didn't have the reserve price at that level, the winning bid would have been the winning bidder would have paid what the second highest person had bid, uh, and not the reserve price. So you can raise the revenue that you earn by charging the reserve price, right? Conditional on the good getting sold. But if the reserve price is above what the person, uh, the top person bids, then the good doesn't get sold at all. So that re it also reduces the quantity that you sell, the uh, expected quantity that you sell, if you raise the reserve price. So you can basically think that by choosing my reserve price, I'm choosing an expected price that I'm going to sell the good for. Right? And that as I raise that expected price, I'm also reducing the probability with which I sell. Right? And so that lets us draw out a demand curve in the auction. Um, and in auctions, notice, basically the marginal cost has to be constant. Why is that? Because it's just the probability with which it sells the good, right? So whatever the cost of the good is, that's the marginal cost of selling it with a little higher probability. So um, the interesting thing is when I not uh, at all do this, they get this future curve, which lets me teach you about iron. So, uh, here's their data, and then an exercise that I did with it. So, um, here's a bunch of these jagged lines are for different priced goods. What is the relationship between the average sales price and the probability with which it's sold? And everything is normalized relative to the uh, relative to the value of the good uh, measured by the average price with which a good of that type sells on eBay, right? So that, that just gets everything into the same term. And the thing that's really astonishing is that across all these different categories, the shapes of the demand curves are pretty much the same. They differ a little bit, but they all have this property that they that they're extremely convex, that they sort of start quite slow and then they get extremely flat, extremely quickly. And remember that when things are very convex, the, uh, the marginal revenue is going to have an interesting relationship with the demand curve and the pass-through rate is going to be very, very high. Right? And that's exactly what we see. So what I did is I took all these things and I fit uh, quite a cubic fit line to them. So that's the smooth line that goes through all the jagged lines. Right? I think it's blue. It fits pretty well, and we can then just use that to draw out a marginal revenue curve. Right? So here's the marginal revenue curve corresponding to that demand curve. And the thing to notice is it goes down, it comes back up again, and then it goes down again. So it's not monotonic decreasing like all the other marginal revenue curves I was showing you. So 
And that creates a little bit of a problem because how do we figure out what the optimal price is then? It could be that there's multiple intersections between the margin, constant marginal cost and the marginal revenue. Imagine that the marginal cost intersected here, only well, we intersect that and that. Which of those would actually correspond to the optimal choice? Well, we'd actually have to integrate the area underneath the two curves and figure out which one is, oh, sorry, one, two, and three intersections. Which one of those is the best? Well, comparing this one to this one, all you get is the extra losses here, the area underneath marginal cost and above, so that's clearly not good. If we compare this one to this one, well, we're going to get this little area of marginal, here, just draw it on here. Um, we're going to get, This little area down here of loss, but we're going to get this big area up here of gain. And so clearly this point over here would be the optimal. Now on the other hand, consider if we had marginal cost up here, well we would get this little area of gain by charging over on the right hand side but we would lose this big area down here. So in this case, the optimum is going to be over here. Now, a way to avoid having to do that separately for every different marginal cost curve we do, is we can actually construct something which is called the iron marginal revenue curve, which avoids uh, this problem by making the marginal revenue curve monotone. How does it do that? Well, so what you do is you start out um, you start out with a horizontal line at the bottom of the point that's problematic, where we're, uh, it just, at the bottom uh, where it just starts to turn off. Right? Then you start raising that line until you reach the point where the area underneath the ironing line and above the marginal cost curve and the area above the ironing line and below the marginal cost curve are equal to one another. Because that's exactly the threshold in which you're going to want to choose the point on the left versus the point on the right. And that's what I've drawn here. Here's the ironing line. It's at about 0.8% of the average sales price on eBay. So what that says is if your opportunity cost of the sale is less than 0.8%, you're going to want to sell the good with very high probability of getting a low average price and a very low reserve price, essentially no reserve price. On the other hand, if it's above 0.8, you're going to want to sell the good very infrequently by charging a high reserve price, something like one. But you're never going to want to charge something in between them. So you'll always want these, you'll always want to sell with quite high probability or quite low probability, not in order. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's basically ironing. Anytime you have a non-monotone marginal revenue curve, or anytime you even have a cost curve that goes up and down, you can always turn it into something that's monotone using this ironing procedure. And that avoids the complications and lets you do everything graphically. Yeah, go ahead. What's behind this um, non-monotone? Why is it non-monotone? Well, the demand sheet. I guess. I mean, so the story that Levin and I now tell is sort of that um, you're pretty much guaranteed to sell the good if you don't if you charge a uh, a reserve price that's like a reasonable fraction of the price, right? I mean, like a third. Or something. You're almost guaranteed to sell. And so that's why it's so flat in this range over here. But then once you start getting up higher it actually starts reducing your probability of sale uh, somewhat. So that's sort of the idea. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll let you out a few minutes over. I'll, I'll take some questions. Yeah, that's a very good question. Are, are any of those individual lines for different product categories not monotone? It looks like the non-monotone aspect comes from trying to fit a cubic system. No, no, no. The, the non-monotone aspect comes from taking the marginal revenue curve. Each one of the individual <coughs> curves is declining, and the cubic fit through them is also declining. 
But then when you take the marginal revenue curve associated with it, because it's so convex, it's not monotone.